Hey everybody, Jason Shadrick here with uh, Premier Guitar. We're at Premier Guitar Headquarters with Chris Eldridge and Julian Lodge, and we are celebrating the release uh, that comes out today, their new album, Mount Royal. And they're going to play some songs, answer some questions, also tell us about these guitars they're playing. So without further ado, let's kick it off with uh, Julian and Chris.
Yeah, well, um, this is a uh, this is an old uh, 1954 D28 named Uncle Johnny. This guitar actually has a proper name, and um, I've had it for uh, I got it back in '04, so I've had it for a while now. And it was it's it's just a really great guitar. It's been it's kind of beat up. Um, it's had all kinds of crazy stuff done to the inside. Like apparently it had a bolt-on bridge at one point. Um, so it's all monkeyed up, but but I. I feel like a lot of these old guitars, my favorite ones are all have been like butchered and put back together. This one is definitely one of those guitars. And this is uh this one I used in like uh the early days of Punch Brothers and uh and then I kinda put it on the shelf for a while because I got an, an older one, like a thirties Martin. And uh I just kinda got it back out. I put a pickup in it finally and, and started using it again. And I'm I'd forgotten how much I love this thing. So but it's really fun playing it with Jules because Jules is playing a new guitar. Mm -hmm. now and these two seem to be pretty good buddies um yeah yeah do. this uh you forgive me i don't have much of a voice getting over being sick but uh this is a callings and i'm thrilled about it it's something that i've been um working on with them for god about two years bill callings and mark alphans and steve mccreary and the whole callings team and um it's related to what became known as the uh t-series the new series by callings which is relatively straightforward guitar, not a lot, of, you know, 
not a lot of deviations from the original Martin prototype, at least for a triplo style guitar. Um, this particular one has a Waterloo finish, uh, taken from their Waterloo line, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and I just love this guitar. The neck is profiled after the Martin I tend to play the most, which is an old 39, triple 018. This is a mahogany guitar, so it's basically a triple 018. Um, and I love it. It's only, a, you know, two months old, maybe, and only has a few hours on it, and it already feels and plays like an old guitar, so I'm very impressed and grateful. It's pretty, pretty badass. It's pretty badass. Bryce Swanson, he wants to ask Chris if living in the Mississippi Valley had the song has any special significance to you and if you have any uh, memories of the song in John Hartford. Oh, well, um, it does have special significance in that, yeah, this song was written by John Hartford, who um, is, uh, for anybody who doesn't, who's not familiar with John Hartford, John Hartford was this um, amazing uh, creative force who kind of came out of the, the bluegrass world um, in the 60s and 70s, he made all these really innovative records. He was a he was a great banjo innovator, but he's a great fiddler too. And more than anything, maybe he was a great songwriter. He wrote a bunch of like incredible classic songs. And he was like he was just like a polymath, you know. He he was a writer on the Smothers Brothers back in the day. He kind of did everything. But uh, as I've kind of gotten older and gotten out of like just um, you know, when I was a young guy, my all my all my heroes. Um, in the acoustic world, anyway, were like Tony Rice and Norman Blake, these these great flat pickers, um, David Greer. But then, as I got a little older, uh, John Hartford kind of really became my guy. And uh, so I was on a John Hartford YouTube binge late one night, and uh, you know, like everybody gets on YouTube binges, and uh, found this crazy song, "Living in the Mississippi Valley," which which was just like the most delightfully, unabashedly happy song I think I'd ever heard. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn that one. It's yeah. it's a it's a it's a good little good little number, but I don't. I and I have a memory of seeing Hartford when I was a kid, uh, but I don't. I, so my dad is is a bluegrass musician. He played in this band called the Seldom Scene, and so I really grew up around a lot of the bluegrass greats when I was a boy. But I was that's what I grew up around, so I didn't care. You know what I mean? And uh, but I do have this memory of a guy playing a fiddle out in an, out in the audience who was like you know, just playing solo and putting it back together. It's like, well, that was definitely John Hartford. Wow, so, so I have that memory, but I didn't care about it at the time, like you do. But, yeah. yeah. That's great. Question for Julian um, from uh, Among Wong Chong Hao. Mm -hmm. Is uh, how do you approach comping behind Chris, uh, especially since you become, or coming from a jazz background? How do I approach comping behind Chris, coming from a jazz background? Um, I do my best to stay out of the way and hopefully give enough support um, where he doesn't feel like the bottom's dropping out. But it's hard. I'm working on it. I don't really know. <laughs> you know, I, I, it. well, I, it's functional. You know, I can, but I, I'm aware that there's a, there's a, um, there's kind of a continuum, especially with uh, rhythm guitar playing that comes from the bluegrass tradition or old time <laughs> tradition. Um, I'm I'm kind of like a moderate. I feel like I have a moderate voice in that world. I, it's not something that I that comes supernaturally to me. I work on it. I want to get better, and um, it's also one of the challenges, which is maybe different than playing in a jazz context. Is with Critter playing a uh, dreadnought guitar, which is so well suited to rhythm, and me playing a smaller body. When we switch solos, um, just naturally a certain amount of low end kind of drops out, at least up on stage. So I have to kind of imply that the bottom didn't drop out. So, um, or at least that's what I think I have to do. I don't know if it's true. But, um, and then jazz comping is a little different because it's a little more, uh, I think it involves more commentary, which in this circumstance would just come across as maybe a bit um, kind of annoying. If I was commenting on everything he played in his solo, it might sound a little matchy-matchy. Uh, uh, in jazz, you can kind of get away with that because with the rhythm section, especially, there's, you know, the time is covered and you're you're there to be, uh, to kind of like a snare drum would be just commenting on certain accents, so they're quite different. Yeah, that's the thing is like we are our own rhythm section. Yeah, we are so, at all times. But yeah, at all times. You guys want to play another song? Sure. Sure. 
What do you feel like? Uh, you want to do uh, Everything Must Go? Sure. Let's do that.
couple people have been asking about uh, a couple people asking about your guys' new gig on Prey on Companion. Oh yeah. That you both have played on. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that's like and some of your favorite memories from doing that this season? Well, it's really Critter's gig. I've done a couple. Uh, I've done three total. Yeah, my uh, Julian's my sub. In that, in that. <laughs> Ostensibly, yeah. No, no, well, no. I come in, I do electric stuff. Um, and uh, it's a ball. I mean, it, it, it happens very fast. Uh, Chris Thiele, who runs it, is exceptional at um, uh, conceiving of the show and seeing it through. And so... In order for that to happen, things have to move very quickly and very clearly as far as song choices, how to rehearse. Um, just decision-making that can make an eight-hour rehearsal feel like 20 minutes. Uh, so we get there typically the day before the show, rehearse all day. The day of, we'll rehearse in, all the way up until the curtains open, so to speak. And, uh, and then we do it. Um, highlights for me have just been all the musicians on the show, you know, getting to sit next to... You know, uh, Alan Hampton or Mike Elizondo or Ted Poor or Stuart Duncan or Thiele or Aoife or any of those people. It's it's pretty remarkable to um, have a gig where you admire everyone so much. Uh, I love it, and uh, I hope to do more. Yeah, yeah, I would kind of echo that. It's uh, it's been really fun to be a part of a. It's you know it's kind of a variety show really, um, and so it's. It's cool, like it's really fun getting the music together. It's like a pressure cooker because you, you know, we don't necessarily. He might tell us the song. There's a birthday segment. He might, you know, send the birthday songs a few days ahead of time. But we usually he writes. Thiele writes a new song every week, and those songs are typically he sends them on a. Uh, it's a voice memo of just mandolin and voice. And it's like, and a lot of times these tunes are kind of crazy, because like, Thiele writes crazy music, and uh, so you have no idea. I don't know. Have you had that experience? Like Absolutely. you get these things, and you're like, I have no idea what the fuck this is, <laughs> any of this is, um, and you kind of show up on Friday morning, and everybody sort of starts playing it, and you kind of go, Oh, I get it. And yeah. all of a sudden, so you're kind of it's it's like everybody's kind of erecting the tent at at the same time. It, it has to all go up at once, uh, but it's been really fun, and it's. Yeah, it's also just cool seeing the actors do their thing. It's like yeah, a really fun show to be to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's been really cool. Um, another uh, fan here asked, could you talk a little bit about on this new record, like your composition process, about maybe how some songs came together? Do you, do you guys kind of write separately and then come together, or plan some time? together to flesh out ideas sure both both yeah i mean we um we we started working on music for this record in october of 2015 um kind of the punch brothers tour cycle was winding down from our last record and jules had some free time and and so we got together in new york and um just, you know, we had the intention uh, on this record of writing a bunch of original music together because our last record, Avalon, um, it's a cool record, but it was it was kind of a mixture of Julian's, some of Julian's uh, instrumentals, and then just some more kind of American songbook in the sense, not necessarily all Gershwin songs, although there is a Gershwin song on there, but, but like, you know, from the songs we really love from like the bluegrass or gospel or jazz you know just whatever the american music canon is but um for this record we wanted it to be a lot more deliberately our own thing and kind of just reflect the voice of the duo so anyway we got together and started started writing and uh we would do you know writing extra timed things like where we'd improvise together or we'd sequester ourselves in different rooms and say all right, let's come meet back here in an hour with four songs written. So like you got 15, you got to write a song every 15 minutes for the next hour. And it's it's just kind of a cool way to um to generate a lot of material. You know, obviously most of it didn't stick, but um but some of it totally did and um and yeah, that was that was kind of the pro and we just kind of kept doing that over the course of yeah. Almost a year, yeah. I mean, we finished recording this past <coughs> September, and you know, as we could get together, we would we would refine material and a bunch of stuff we thought was cool. We'd we'd live with it and decide it wasn't cool and throw it out, and then other stuff just kind of would appear out of nowhere. So 
Yeah, it was a, you know, it was like anything, but it was a, it was a lot of work. I second all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guitar nerds also want to know about, we talked about your guitars before, but what about picks and strings? What are you uh -huh. guys using there? We, uh, we both use blue chip picks. I use a TP50. I've been using blue chip picks for a long time, as of you probably. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I just love them. They wear in beautifully, and I, I, uh, especially with acoustic guitar, I really like them. But I use them for electric too. The strings are Diodario, another thing I've used for a long time. These are 12 gauge, which is light. Is that considered light? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's my story. Yeah. Phosphorus bronze. I'm I'm pretty similar. I'm I use a blue chip. Uh, this for this tour, I'm using a 50, a tad 50. I, I like the slightly bigger triangle, uh, but it's the same thickness as Julian's, and like, which I think works really well for for this music. Like if I'm playing in Punch Brothers, where I'm really having to like hammer out rhythm in a different way, just playing power chords half the time. Like I'll use a thicker pick, but but uh, I love the blue chips. Okay, so we had a question about how we met. Uh, Critter and I met. Was it five years ago? Six years ago? No, it was nine years ago. Really? It was in April of 2008. How do you remember this? Stuff? I've got a weird what brain. Uh. I think it was April 7th, actually. Sorry, it's like a, there's a little bit of latent, like, uh, never mind. There's nothing latent yeah. about it. <laughs> but, yeah, it no, that's great. Uh, we met at a Punch Brothers show in Boston, and it was at the time I was getting ready to make uh, my first record, band record. And... Uh, I was going to their show to meet up with Chris Thiele because we had arranged to do something with Bela Fleck together on that record. And anyway, I went backstage before the show and I put my guitar down and uh, Critter and I met and we kind of made a plan to play a tune later after the show, which is exactly what happened. They finished the set, I went backstage, we played, and it was kind of just an immediate um, excitement and feeling of like, wow, this is really cool. You know, I, I have what could be considered a minuscule understanding of uh, fiddle tunes. I don't play them a lot. I, I, I probably know the same four that I knew when I met you <laughs> that I do now, with the exception of the ones we learned for this band. Um, but of the ones I knew, we launched into all of them, and it just felt like I could be free, that I loved the music, I liked our sounds together. And we more or less vowed to do it again. And for about three years, we, um, we kind of hinted at it. We'd get together, we'd practice, and then eventually Critter had the foresight to say, look, if we don't just do it, it's not ever going to You got to put it on the calendar. Got to put That's it on the, the calendar. Yeah. So we set some dates to make an EP, which was our first recording, uh, with our dear friend Rob Griffin that we did in Columbus, Ohio. And furthermore, we set up a handful of dates to kind of promote this thing. And uh, in, in very short order it all kind of happened we suddenly were a band we were suddenly a an entity that could tour and uh and it's kind of been a steady evolution ever since so that's our story i think we're gonna play you one more song yeah well, uh, thank you so much guys for stopping by absolutely office. thank you thanks so for much, having Jason. us thanks to everyone here. thanks all you we guys for watching guitar. and listening yeah thanks for watching listening and uh, what tune do you guys want to end with? Well, you know the answer to that because this is a special request for our friend Jason Shadrick. This is a song called Mean Mother Blues. said she gone out to play I know the river's done gone dry she's trapped another fly I got nothing to do but a few more words to say I got the mean woman blues Lord knows I lose I just can't seem to get her off my mind she's an all-night rocket mother Lord knows I love her but she's even me to ramble on up the line I 
kissed the blues goodbye. She lit my torch and left the burners on high. Lord, the money that I paid for that living, loving maid. Now she's left me here to grieve, moan, and cry. I got the mean woman blues. Lord knows I lose. I just can't seem to get her off my mind. She's an all-night rocket mother. Lord knows I love her. She's leaving me to ramble on up the line. If you hear my song, you know just what I mean. Lord, I think it's all just a part of the woman's scheme. If you're buying what she sells, she'll run you straight to hell. Captivate your mind and pick the truth so clean. I got the mean woman blues. Lord knows I lose. I just can't seem to get her off my mind. She's an all-night rocking mother. Lord knows I love her. She's even me to ramble on up the line. watching.